So Jesus, uh, grace. And it truly is uh, amazing grace. So once again, you've given us the grace of your true body and your tr true blood in this holy sacrament of communion. A gift that continues to be given to your big C church, your church with a capital C, just over and over again. So we're one church in your big C church, and, uh, and you love giving us uh, gifts. So thank you for this gift. And may your grace continue to be uh, made evident to us over and over and over again. We pray these things in your name, Jesus. Amen. So again, uh, obviously, um, uh, Sunday, uh, real, real different from most of the Sundays, uh, the other 51 Sundays and that with uh, no live music today. And so uh, thanks for uh, being here. Thanks for uh, entering into worship, even with it being a little bit uh, different than that. So uh, we... Um, I'm, I'm still just moving through the book of Acts. You know, we've been in the book of Acts, uh, chapters 1 through 10. With that AD, the Bible continues. Uh, the mini epic series in and kind of strange. So we'll get to see what happens when they uh, release the DVDs. But I wanted to spend uh, uh, this week yet in um, Acts 15. In Acts chapter 15, there's something that happens there that I'm just, uh, again, fascinated by and something that I um, didn't really realize for a lot of years until just uh, maybe a couple years ago that I realized that something really, I mean, it's significant that happened in Acts 15. I knew it was significant for many, many years in that. So over the last number of weeks now, we keep uh, drawing, I've been drawing this circle on this, uh, and the whole idea is that... Uh, Jesus makes it possible for us who are out, for all people who are out of his grace, outside of his, um, uh, his gifts, outside of his love, outside of the purposes of God, Jesus, the whole story of Jesus is that he makes it possible for us, of us who are out to uh, come in. And uh, so that's the story of the church. That's been the story of God's people from the beginning. Uh, and Adam and Eve, uh, they were in when they started. They had this grace of God when they started. Because of their sin, they were put out into the wilderness. And, but right there in Genesis chapter 3, 15, Genesis 3, verse 15, uh, scholars tell us that's the first promise of the gospel, that those that have now been out, God is going to make a way for them to come back in. And that, that, that how that's going to happen is going to be through the person, the work, the ministry, the grace of Jesus. And so the rest of the story is, uh, of, the, of the Bible is, there's these people out, how is God working to the, bring them in? There's the people out, how is God working to bring them in? He's going to work through the Israelites. He's going to uh, create all this history. And here's all these stories, all these stories pointing to Jesus, pointing to Jesus, pointing to Jesus. The Messiah, the Messiah, the Messiah is coming. And he's going to bring us all in. Uh, again, we know that uh, the cross happens at a certain place in a certain time. Uh, but yet the cross, what happens on the cross, extends before it and extends after it to our day. And so uh, we are still living in a world where people are out. Uh, the Bible makes it clear that all of us start out. All of us start out. Uh, there's this, uh, you know, the Bible tells us, though, that we can be baptized in the name of Christ. We can live in this name of, of Jesus. We can follow this Jesus. We can be in. We can be in. But there's always these forces that are looking to push us out. In Acts chapter 15, that's the whole question. That, that there's, there's these people coming in. Uh, Jesus is bringing them in. But there are uh, forces saying, but can they come in like that, is there something that we need to do? Is there something that should be done? Because we've got all this history, all this tradition. Here's what we think of, of how God has, has brought people in in the past. And they don't seem to be following that rule. Uh, again, there's always this idea that sometimes those, the, the, that, those that are blocking, these, blocking people from coming out to coming in are the people who are already in. Sometimes that the people that are already in want to put up a barrier so that the people that are out can't come in unless they come in through the way that they think they should come in. In Acts chapter 15, they have this meeting, and it's a huge meeting. Uh, again, here's just a, 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 in Acts chapter 15, when you start reading through the names that gather in this meeting in Jerusalem, 
it looks like probably all of the writers of all of the New Testament books and letters are gathered in this meeting. All of them. All of them. And I think that's pretty significant. God is saying this meeting, this meeting in this place at this time, kind of to resolve an issue that is, needs to be resolved, needs to have everyone in this meeting. So we know that Peter is in this meeting. We're going to read from Acts chapter 15 uh, in, a, in a little while. But uh, Peter is mentioned. Uh, so Peter writes First and Second Peter. Uh, the Gospel of Mark, even though it doesn't have Peter's name, scholars say that uh, this person Mark uh, wrote as Peter told the story to Mark, that somehow it gets the name of Mark. So Peter is significant, as you know. It's going to mention James, who, not the James that was one of the disciples, but James, the brother of Jesus. The reason that we know that it's James, the brother of Jesus, is that James, the disciple, has been martyred already. He's been put to death. So it's James, the brother of Jesus, who writes the letter of James. We're also told that Judas is there, and Judas, not Judas Iscariot, but uh, Judas, who's also known as Jude, who is another brother of Jesus, who writes the real little, little letter called uh, Jude. Uh, we know that uh, Luke is there. Luke is the one that writes the Gospel of Luke and also Acts, the, this whole story of Acts. So he's recording this story in Acts chapter 15. Uh, John's there, the disciple that writes the Gospel of John, that writes the three letters of John and writes the book of Revelation. So John's there. Um, Matthew there is, is probably there. Uh, Matthew, the disciple that writes uh, Matthew. And we know that Paul is there. And Paul writes almost two-thirds of the, and, and kind of the, the whole meaning is going to re revolve around, here's all these people that are out, especially these Gentiles that were out. Paul and his uh, partner Barnabas have been uh, out in all kinds of other places bringing people in. They've been seeing firsthand undeniable evidence that this Jesus that is in them is just Jesus has come into these people there and he's, he's bringing them in. But there's this question whether they're really in. Can they just believe in Jesus and that's it? That's, is that simple? And so there's this tension here and it's a huge, huge meeting. I think more than likely, and again, this is just, you know, the, so all the books in the New Testament, if you go home and look in your contents or your New Testament uh, book in that, right, all the authors are there gathered in this meeting. The only one that we don't know is Hebrews, and the reason that we don't know that is because we don't really know who the author of Hebrews is, but more than likely, I'm thinking that he was there. And heaven, we get to get the full story and all the details in that. But so Acts 15 is this very, very pivotal point. Because how the kingdom of God is going to expand, how the kingdom of God is going to bring, bring, bring people from out to in, is kind of in question. That's the big question. Again, there's this, all this evidence, all these stories of Gentiles coming from in to out. We're going to even hear that in Acts chapter 15 as they're having this meeting and kind of seeing what it is that God would have them to, uh, to do. And so we're, 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 what we're seeing here is that all the people gathered, they just, they, they just know that Jesus is in all of us who are gathered in this meeting. We know. We, we know. We have these experiences with Jesus. We've been following this Jesus. We've been serving this Jesus. We, do, we know that Jesus is in all of us. And all of them gathered in that meeting, they're in Jesus. They're looking to follow Jesus no matter what. So what happens in Acts chapter 15 reaches us in these moments. With Acts chapter 15, without Acts chapter 15 and what happens there, it's a good chance that probably many of us wouldn't be here in this moment. As we say it around here over and over again, that God's kingdom is ever warmly expanding in us and then through us and all around us and way beyond us. The question in Acts chapter 15 is, will God's kingdom be able to do that? Well, it, you know, they're, they're experiencing and expanding in, in us and the kind of experience, but will it happen all around us and way beyond us? Will it happen in ways that we don't have control of? So a, a part of what happens in Acts chapter 15 is why here at New Hope we have these driving values that behind every set of eyes I look into, there's a soul that matters to God. So that soul that is out, it matters to God, and there should be a way for that soul to come in. And that's what we want to be about as a church. 
first of all, that all of our souls here, they matter. And God is working and made it possible for us to be brought in. But if our souls matter and we've been brought in, how do other souls that matter, how can they be brought in? That's why we say that we want to keep uh, inviting and inspiring souls to follow this Jesus. Inviting those who are out. Not just once, not just twice. Just over and over and over again. Inviting them, inviting them, and then inspiring them and inspiring them. Inspiring us that are already in, that we would keep following Jesus. Because there's always, again, these forces that want to take us out, that want to take us out, that we can do on our own. That we can, our good works, that our good behavior, that our, you know, who we are can keep us in. Those are lying forces. So we want to keep inviting and inspiring souls to follow this Jesus. And then we say that we are God's chosen, holy, and dearly loved. And to be God's chosen, holy, and dearly loved means you're in. You're in. You're chosen, in. God is making you holy in. God is dearly loving us in. And then we say there's a, a warm family waiting for you. A warm family waiting for you. A family that is centered in, in this God. And the last thing we always say is that it's more Jesus, less world. More Jesus, less world. More Jesus, less world. More in, less out. More in, less out. So when you go to Acts chapter 15, it's all about that. It's this question, what they're going to wrestle with, what they're kind of going to wrestle with to the ground. There, there, there's going to be some, um, I want us to realize that when Acts chapter 15 is happening and some of the dialogue is happening, there's a lot of energy. This isn't just, you know, oh, and then Jesus kind of, we had this little disagreement. And, no, there, 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 there's some passion here. There's, there's some anger here. There's, there's some things that they're wrestling to the ground here. And again, the whole, it really revolves around who can come in and how can they come in? Is this name Jesus? Is the person of Jesus? Do you just have to say you believe in him and then you can come in? That all the other rules that we thought applied before this are no longer in play. So that's what's going on in Acts chapter 15. So let me read uh, Acts chapter 15. So it says, Some men came down from Judea to Antioch and were teaching the brothers, Unless you are circumcised according to the custom taught by Moses, you cannot be saved. Again, for us as we're thinking about this, those that are out, unless you are circumcised, men, unless you have some surgery, you cannot come in. That's the premise. That's the premise. We know about Jesus, and we know that you believe in Jesus, but you really can't believe in Jesus unless you get cut. This brought Paul and Barnabas into sharp dispute and debate with them. So Paul and Barnabas were appointed along with some other believers to go up to Jerusalem to see the apostles and the elders about this question. So again, even though... Uh, Paul is this huge, huge force in the church. And we recognize him as a huge force in the church at this time. He's just one voice. And so there's this sharp dispute and debate among them. But Paul and Barnabas can't ride over it and say, this is what's right and you've got to follow this. And so they get sent off to Jerusalem to meet with well, we, all the people that we said that are present at this meeting. But the elders, about this question, who can come in, how can they come in? The church sent them on their way, and as they traveled through Phoenicia and Samaria, they told how the Gentiles, so Phoenicia and Samaria, there's some kind of outlying areas, there's some Jewish believers there. Um, they told how the Gentiles had been converted. This news made all the brothers very glad. So there's this evidence that Jesus has come in, Jesus has come in. There's so many Gentiles that have come in, come in, come in, in this name of Jesus, in the power of this name of Jesus, in the grace of Jesus. 
They're just, they're, they're, and they're, they're glad they, they've been hearing these stories. When they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and the elders to whom they reported everything God had done through them. Always giving credit to God. Always giving credit to God. We were there, but God has been doing this. Then some of the believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees stood up and said, the Gentiles must be circumcised and required to obey the law of Moses. The apostles and elders met to consider this question. After much discussion, Peter got up. Peter's always the, the, the leader of this early church and addressed them. Brothers, you know that some time ago God made a choice among you that the Gentiles might hear from my lips the message of the gospel and believe. That's what happens in Acts chapter 10 that we were looking at last week. God who knows the heart showed that he accepted them by giving the Holy Spirit to them just as he did to us. He made no distinction between us and them, circumcised and uncircumcised, for he purified their hearts by faith. Now then, why do you try to test God by putting on the necks of the disciples a yoke that neither we nor our fathers have been able to bear? No, we believe it is through the grace of our Lord Jesus that we are saved just as they are. He's speaking truth. He's speaking grace. He's speaking what even today we can feel that's, this is right. We can feel that in our hearts. What he just, what we just heard there, we just know that somehow that rings true. It rings true for us. And then it says, uh, when they, uh, then the whole assembly became silent as they listened to Barnabas and Paul telling about the miraculous signs and wonders God had done among the Gentiles through them. So Paul and Barnabas, here's some stories. Here's so many people that were out, these Gentiles. They were out and we started telling them about Jesus. And they came in. And we saw evidence of how they came in. Saw evidence at times that the Spirit of God landed on them and they came in. The same experiences we've had with Jesus, we've seen it happen in them too. So they tell story after story after story about Jesus has come into these people that they have been working with. Verse 13, when they finished, James, the brother of Jesus, James spoke up because he's kind of recognized now as also a leader of, in this early church. Brothers, listen to me. Concerned by taking from the Gentiles a people, I'm sorry, Simon has, Simon Peter, Peter has described to us how God at first showed his concern by taking from the Gentiles a people for himself. The words of the prophets are in agreement with this as it is written. So James is going to reach back and say, here's what the Old Testament has said. We've, maybe if we've missed it, but here's what the Old Testament has said, that there are going to be time when God is going to reach out to the whole world, not just to those of us who are Jewish. So he says, uh, um, the words of, our, of the prophets are in agreement with this as it is written. After this, I will return and rebuild David's fallen tent. Its ruins I will rebuild and I will restore it that the remnant of men may seek the Lord in all the Gentiles who bear my name, says the Lord, who does these things that have been known for ages. It is my judgment, therefore, this is James, it is my judgment, therefore, that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. It is my judgment that we should not put up a barrier for those that are out that God is bringing in. Don't put a barrier in the way. Let's not make it difficult for Gentiles to come in. Instead, this is, we should write to them telling them to abstain from food polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from the meat of strangled animals in blood. For Moses has been preached in every city from the earliest times and is read in the synagogues on every Sabbath. So there's Jewish synagogues kind of all over the place. That's where oftentimes the Apostle Paul is going as he goes to these foreign cities. There's a synagogue there. He starts there. He always starts there with this message of Jesus. He's tying in. Here's all the stuff of the Old Testament. And then not only are there Jewish people in these synagogues, but the, the Gentiles around there, they know what that it's going on in that building. They've had conversations with their neighbors about who this God is of the Old Testament. They've heard the stories. They know the history of this God and work. And so some of them start to believe they're interested in this God. 
So then we read, Then the apostles and elders with the whole church decided to choose some of their own men and send them to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas. Again, that's where the question originated. So Barnabas is going to take this answer from this whole council back to Antioch and say, here's what has been decided to answer this question. So it says, um, uh, they chose also Judas called Barsabbas and Silas, two men who were leaders among the brothers. With them, they sent the following letter, the apostles and the elders, your brothers, to the Gentile believers in Antioch, Syria, and Cilicia, greetings. And they write this. We have heard that some went out from us without our authorization and disturbed you. Some others, good intentions. They want you in. But they don't understand that you can come in without all this stuff from their background, from their history. They were troubling your minds by what they said. So we all agreed, we all agreed to choose some men and send them to you with our dear friends Barnabas and Paul. So not just Barnabas and Paul, but some others, you know, kind of authorized by this big meeting to go with them. So it's just not coming from Barnabas and Paul. They could, you know. Men who have risked their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. They're in. If you risk your life for the Lord Jesus, you're in. Forces come at you and want to push you out and you risk your life because you know that Jesus has brought you in. So therefore we are sending Judas and Silas to confirm by word of mouth what we are writing. It seemed good to the Holy Spirit... And to us not to burden you with anything beyond the following requirements. And here's the letter. Here's the whole letter. This is so short. So powerful. They write this. You are up to abstain from food sacrificed to idols, from blood, from the meat of strangled animals, and from sexual immorality. You will do well to avoid these things. Farewell. Now, again, for most of us, you know, this whole food sacrifice to idols, we don't get that from blood, uh, the meat strang from strangled an animals. We get sexual immorality. But all these, these, these four things that are listed, each one of them has kind of a soul-destroying effect. You can't be in and keep dabbling in these four areas and so again we don't really think much about those first three areas but we live in a culture that's real hard to measure how much soul damage is happening over and over and over with sexual immorality again we can't uh you know, it doesn't do us any good to go out into the woods and try to escape this culture. We just know that if we think that somehow we can play with that because everybody else is playing with it and sometimes people in the church are playing with it and we hear stories, again, heard a very, very prominent pastor that just fell again, had an affair out of the ministry. So soul-destroying. So we know that there are still forces that want to destroy our souls. But the question is, can we come in? Can we come in? You will do well to avoid these things. Come on in. Come on in. Now catch this. Here's the, the conclusion. So the men were sent off and went down to Antioch and where they, gathered, where they gathered the church together and delivered the letter. And then this. The people read it and were glad for its encouraging message. And again, if you've been following this, I've been trying, you know, because we're a family church and that, trying, trying to track with this. Uh, who is most glad when this letter appears and the, the people hear it in Antioch? Who is most glad? It will be the men. The men are really glad because I can be in Jesus without surgery. I can be in Jesus without having to get cut. I like this Jesus. I like him a lot. I want to follow him. I'm so glad that that barrier has been removed. Again, what we know, what we know, what we know is that 
even though this is so long ago and that's not the issue anymore, we still know that there are people in, in, in that oftentimes don't want people to be able to come out from in without having to go through some kind of struggle like they've had to go through, some kind of suffering like they've had to suffer. We don't want people to just kind of get a free, easy pass. There's never a free, easy pass for anyone who comes in and gets this grace of Jesus. Never. We won't all suffer the same. We won't have to wrestle the same. But yet all of us know in this room this morning that there are forces, there are forces, there are forces trying to push us out. And sometimes those forces just out aren't out there in our culture, aren't out there in the government, aren't out there in the Supreme Court, aren't out there in the pop culture. They're out there. But sometimes those forces are right in here. You've gotten a look. I've gotten a look at times from someone that was in church and they looked at me and said, you don't follow Jesus good. You aren't following Jesus the way you should. Sometimes people have not just given you a look. They've spoken some words to you. And some of you can still remember some of those words. Even if it's been years ago. And we come back to this. Can we listen to Jesus? Because Jesus, when he speaks to you, when he speaks to me, when he speaks to you, is always saying, I want you in. I want you in. I know about the sexual immorality that you keeps coming at you that you wrestle with, I want you in. I I know how you keep wrestling with some broken relationships in your family, sometimes in your marriage. And some of that blame you put on yourself and some of that blame you put on the other person, some of that blame you put on all the other stuff around. But I want you in. I can give you healing. I can give you a piece of soul. So again, as we wrap up, as we hear this message today, as we hear from Acts chapter 15, again, when you realize the setting of it, that here's all this kind of, the the whole, all the writers in the New Testament are in this meeting. And that God is present in this meeting. And that the Holy Spirit is present in this meeting. And that Jesus, Jesus, Jesus is present in this meeting. And they come up with this solution to answer this question. Can you come in? And how can you come in? And the answer is, yes, you can come in. And you can come in in the name of Jesus. Does that kind of glad and encourage your heart that Jesus is in us and we are in Jesus? Again, how are we in Jesus and how is Jesus in, is in, in us? It's because of Jesus. The answer is always Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus wants us in. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus will move all kinds of obstacles. When you run into an obstacle, or an obstacle runs into you, the obstacle is not from Jesus. Jesus wants you in. He always wants you in. Lori mentioned our son, Jared, when he came back from his first tour of duty over in Iraq. We went down to greet him, and I never get it right, south of North Carolina, one of those. Um, Lejeune. And it's by the ocean, and we got a condo by the ocean. And I, you know, don't get by the ocean real often. 
But I got to spend some time, we got to spend some time out on the ocean. And I'm a little bit of a historian. I've read like the John Adams biography and, you know, some of the uh, other biographies of some of our founding fathers and some of the history. And as you're by the ocean, whether it's the Atlantic or the Pacific, um, we know that the ocean waves just keep coming in. They just keep coming in. They just come, keep coming in. And for hundreds and hundreds of years, they keep coming in, keep coming in. Wherever there is an ocean in the world, those waves are just going to keep coming in, keep coming in. Jesus is like an ocean. He just keeps coming. He's inviting us, he's inviting us, he's inviting us, he's inviting us to step in. And to be just kind of caught up in him. Jesus wants us in. And he never stops. He knows that there are people that won't step in. But he's always inviting he knows there are people that, are, that will step in and the waves sometimes get real scary and they want to go running out. Sometimes he knows that people step in and there's other forces that try to push him out. But Jesus wants us in. Oh, does he want us in? He wants each one of us in. So if you would, we're going to uh, pray. We'll have you stand and then we'll sing our last song. Jesus wants us in. We pray. So Jesus, for the wonder of Acts chapter 15, recorded in the Bible, your holy word, uh, thank you for this teaching this morning. Thank you for stirring in our hearts. Thank you for confirming for those of us who are already in and we're in quite a ways that we get to stay there. Thank you, Jesus, for those that are thinking about, boy, do I want to come in? Do I want to come in? Sometimes it hurts. Sometimes there's stuff, some questions that I'm not getting answered. Do I really want to stay in? Do I really want to stay in? Looks like all the people that are out, they're having a lot of fun. But Jesus, you want me in. Help me to listen to your voice more than all the other voices. Jesus, help me t take a step, maybe just a first step, Maybe a 6,000th step. Maybe a 600,000th step. But keep me in, Jesus. Keep us in. We ask and pray this, Jesus, in your name. Amen. Let's stand. Let's sing the song, Oceans, and we'll be on our way to enjoy more of this day. <laughs>